Morning. Today is the 2nd of November 2018. I have been at the Judicial Review for the Leveson Inquiry yesterday in which there was a case brought by the Hacked Off group representing victims of surveillance and entrapment from the likes of the News of the World and the Sunday Times, uh, or by the News of the World and the Sunday Times, uh, against the government. So the government and the News of the World have decided to drop the inquiry into hacking, surveillance, entrapment, um, bullying. Lots of people died as well from the results of Rupert Murdoch's bullying approach to politics and newspapers. The extent to which Rupert Murdoch's influence and control over the government reached as far as having Andy Coulson, his, uh, one of his News of the World editors, I think, became David Cameron's press secretary. He ended up going to jail. Rebecca Brooks managed to escape and they ended up having to close one of their newspapers. But Murdoch's influence over the government and the way in which this country works is fairly commonly known. And that is really what was being discussed here. So for a judicial review in which Rupert Murdoch, very powerful billionaire, was essentially on trial, or at least his agenda was on trial, it was very one-sided and there was hardly anybody there. There were very few members of the public there, I mean probably 10, if that, if you think about it, because the people who had brought the case, they're not really members of the public because they've paid for the case. That's hacked off. Um, and yeah, I saw a few other people there. But I mean, most of the guys in suits there, I couldn't really tell if they were there with the government or with News International. The case, I've, I've said this in a previous recording, I'll just say it again. Uh, the judge, one of the most interesting moments was when the QC representing Hacked Off said that the Prime Minister had promised to have a Leveson part to a second inquiry because Leveson, the first one that happened in 2011, was arranged to look into what had happened, but there were still ongoing court cases, and so they were going to split the inquiry into two parts, and the second would be after the court cases had finished, they could work out who had done what to who and lessons that could be learned, etc. And in May, the then Digital and Culture Media Minister, Matt Hancock, said, let's bin it. The Tories were whipped and the DUP joined in and they said no more Leveson too. So that's why this case has been brought and that's the reason why the government are now in league with Murdoch openly to stop a inquiry. I think the whole Philip Green story has been very interesting because he has been targeted as public enemy number one as a way of distracting from what is happening with the press regulation. So they're able to say, we can target anybody and we target anybody for the little man, or in this case, the little or brown woman, because they say that he's been racially and sexually harassing people. So obviously nobody likes Philip Green, and they've held it back until now. Claire Newell, who's head of investigations for The Telegraph, was at the Sunday Times with the blagger John Ford. We'll be hearing from him in a minute, a previous interview that I'd done with him. Uh, I did with him about two or three weeks ago. And yeah, all in all, it's very clever to see the way in which the Tories are moving into identity politics and owning Me Too. Um, I will show you some excerpts from newspapers that have published very conservative approaches to Me Too uh, very soon. But for now, let us go to the interview with Nicholas Wilson. I'm calling you because you, you have noticed some things about Lisa Osofsky, who is in charge of the Serious Fraud Office. Could you tell me what have you noticed and what have you been telling people? Well, um, I think um, the, the background has to be made clear as well, because as as most people know, HSBC entered into a deferred prosecution agreement in the United States in 2012 um, for laundering drug cartel money and terrorist money and so on. Um, and when you enter into a DPA, um, you have to appoint a monitor to keep it, you know, to make sure that you're complying with the terms of the court order. And HSBC choose who the monitor will be, and they chose a firm. Uh, in the States called Exiger, 
And so the monitor in the States is a man called uh, Tchaikovsky. I think it's Michael Tchaikovsky. Um, and in Europe, the monitor was Lisa Ossofsky. Now, uh -huh. the, the, now, the interesting thing is that the, the point of the DPA is that HSBC were, were not to commit any of the other crimes which were subject to the DPA during its five-year period. And it's well, it was well known last year that they were involved in what's known as the Russian laundromat. And they were the biggest British bank to be involved in laundering Russian money. Um, so just to clarify, when you're, when you're subject to a deferred prosecution agreement, you've been very naughty, mm -hmm. such as allowing money laundering to take place through your bank. Yeah. And then you, you sign this DPA, deferred prosecution agreement, to avoid uh, the charge of corporate criminality, etc. And then you're not supposed to commit any crime during that period. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. any crimes which are the subject of the deferred prosecution agreement. And in that case, it would be money laundering um, and breaching of sanctions. Um, right. And it's important also to understand that HSBC paid $1.9 billion in lieu of being prosecuted, but they weren't prosecuted because George Osborne, the Chancellor at the time, uh, wrote to Ben Bernanke uh, pleading with them not to prosecute HSBC because it would destabilise the world economy um, and they would lose their... Okay, George Osborne, powers. who's... Okay, George Osborne, who's currently the editor of the Evening yes, Standard in yes, London. Correct. Um, okay. So let's uh, go move forward to last year uh, when I stood for Parliament. Um, I was uh, against Amber Rudd, who was the Home Secretary last year. Um, at a hustings in Rye, uh, she's the MP for Hastings and Rye, uh, I started talking, well, we were talking about the Manchester terror attack and, and I started talking about HSBC and their connection with Saudi Arabia uh, because my view is as long as we're selling arms to Saudi Arabia, these terrorist attacks are likely to continue. Uh, but the moment I mentioned HSBC, Amber Rudd wrote a note to the chairman of the meeting and he immediately shut me down. Uh, so I quickly changed the changed tack on my talk and started talking about the Tory plans to scrap the Serious Fraud Office and instead uh, the um, National Crime Agency would take over the role of the Serious Fraud Office. Now the National Crime Agency is under the auspices of the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd. Sure, I remember you pointing, I remember watching the video and you turned around and you said to her, fine, if you don't want me to talk about Saudi Arabia and HSBC and um, Theresa May's husband uh, doing business with yeah. them, then uh, I've got something else to talk to you about. That's a serious fraud office. I don't particularly like it, but I don't want it closed down because at least it's supposed to be independent exactly. and it, it would be merged with the National Crime Agency, uh, which would therefore be headed by you, so, Mrs. Wright. Exactly. So, um, I, uh, what I've discovered in the last few days is that Lisa Osofsky, who is married to uh, an American lawyer called Mark uh, Wasserman, um, uh -huh. her firm Exeger were paid, this is reported in the Telegraph, were paid £200 million a year uh, to do the monitoring work. And a lot of that work um, was given to Mark Wasserman's firm, law firm, Sidley Austin, which are an American firm, but he's based in London. Uh, right. And similarly, well, the, I'll also mention there was another partner at Sidley Austin who resigned from the firm in 2016 because he was being prosecuted for uh, alleged tax evasion uh, connected with a scheme which was set up by HSBC Bank to fraudulently avoid tax, so the scheme was called Zeus Partners, and and I, I understand. Okay, but just 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 before you go any further, yeah. um, so Lisa Osofsky, yeah. it appears that she was in charge of Exeger, which were the compliance. She monitoring she worked for, she worked she, for Exeger. I don't think she was in charge okay. of it, but she worked for. Them. Okay, but she was in charge of their European yes. division. Yeah, and she either she or her boss would have given the contract to her husband to look after a lot of the business. Her husband's firm, yeah. And there were a lot of, there, there were a lot of people in Sydney, uh, Austin, who were handling, you know, working on the monitor 
Okay, sorry, so, right. Um, and then the other thing is that you said that um, the report that it was 200 million came from the Telegraph. Yeah. I believe that the Telegraph, at the time that you were running against Amber Rudd, they said that they quoted Lisa Osofsky as saying that perhaps the serious fraud office's time had come and that it would be better to merge it with the National Crime oh, Agency. Okay, I didn't know that. But that's, that it yeah. all, it yeah, all no, ties I, in. I did, yeah, so I did some research into her a few months but ago my, my, and that my, did come up. My major point is, and as I keep saying and tweeting and blogging about, is that there is a major cover-up. There is a major protection league uh, supporting HSBC um, especially during the five-year period of its DPA, which is why Rona Fairhead, an HSBC director, was put in by Cameron to head the BBC. And I've monitored the BBC during that period, and they didn't cover any HSBC crimes. Um, so there is this major concerted effort to keep HSBC out of the news. I mean, they report things like press releases from regulators, but they don't investigate and they don't, expose anything themselves especially the guardian which is the largest well that's not entirely that's not entirely true nick because i remember in february 2015 there was the panorama where yes Dorset yes but that was in Creek. that was in production just prior to um um rona fairhead starting and 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 that went ahead but since that panorama uh, there's there was nothing i see there's nothing on the bbc so okay sorry so so here we've got Lisa Rosowski's husband's firm involved getting quite a lot of the money from HSBC. And, and incidentally, Lisa Rosowski was employed by HSBC uh, as the monitor. So I discovered recently that in October last year, Lisa Rosowski and Mark Wasserman took out a mortgage with HSBC to buy a mansion flat in Kensington. Uh, Zoopla which is an online uh, estate agent type site, uh, valued the property at 3.3 million. I don't know how much the mortgage was. They're obviously both wealthy people. Um, but I think it's a rather strange situation that she should take out a mortgage with the bank that she is monitoring for compliance with major criminal activity. Um, and I've I, I've got the records of that mortgage or, or the, the title deeds for the property, um, and then okay, could you just could you just go over again? So you said that Lisa Rossi earlier on you said she was employed by HSBC. Yeah. Do you really mean yes. that, or do you mean her firm? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, her firm, I guess, but but she, you know, as an employee of the firm, by default, she's she was employed by HSBC. Yeah, she's definitely getting her income. For yes, HSBC, yes, really, yes. Like, like, like the Guardian. Um, so, uh, so they took out this mortgage, and then in December it was announced that HSBC was going to be released from its deferred prosecution agreement. So, in a f so she takes out, she takes out the mortgage in October 2017, and then she releases them in December. Um, uh, which which means that it, it has been deemed that in the five years of its DPA they haven't been engaging in any of the activities covered by the DPA. Well, as I've mentioned at the beginning, um, it's well known that they were involved in Russian money laundering. Bloomberg reported that they were involved in illegal capital transfers out of China through its Hong Kong branch. Um, it was involved in tax evasion in Switzerland. Uh, well, it... So hold on a second. The, de the Department of Justice asked the, the compliance monitor to um, have a look at everything to make sure HSBC were behaving. Yeah. HSBC both misbehave and uh, lend money to the person who they are supposed to be monitored by. Yeah. Um, in fact, they lend money to the person who they are supposed to be monitored by, but in actual fact, they are the biggest client of. So they are HSBC are the client of Lisa Rosowski and they are her uh, lender. They borrow, they they lend her money as well. Yeah, yeah. So she's making money off them in two ways, as well as her husband um, taking business off them, or at least his firm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's important to stress that you know I don't know how much the mortgage is, and I don't know what the terms of the mortgage are. But uh, at the very worst, it's it's a serious lack of judgment. <laughs> to, to get involved with HSBC at, at a time like that. 
Um, so they were released in December. And then last year, uh, uh, this year, in February, it was announced that the prosecution into the other partner, his name is Carhill, I think it's Michael Carhill, um, but the prosecution against him was dropped by the CPS. And the reason was given that they had not, uh, it was a ministry to cock up and they, they, they had done a lot of things technically wrong. Um, and, but his lawyer at the time said, you know, that they concentrated on him but completely ignored HSBC's role in the, in the whole fraud. Uh, 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 they are HSBC are now apparently being investigated by the FCA uh, for it and HMRC. Um, so he was he he was, the charges against him were dropped. And then in May uh, there was an article in the Times um, expressing frustration at the fact that everybody seemed to know that Lisa Rosowski was in the frame to be the next director of the Serious Fraud Office, um, but they hadn't announced it yet. And the and the Times said. I mean, I, I've put a screenshot of this on, on my website. Um, that there seemed to be a significant uh, um, glitch. glitch. That's the word. Thank you. Glitch in the vetting process of Lisa Rosowski, and that could be related to the fact that she's the monitor of HSBC, and it may be difficult to extract her from that. Um, but I think it was in June. It was formally announced that she was going to be the next director, and. And she is now the director of the Serious Fraud Office. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, because she's ex-Goldman Sachs, FBI, Department of Justice. But one of the things that they don't really say is that between um, between her two or three years as money laundering officer for Goldman Sachs in 2003, 2004, and her job at Exeger from 2013... She's in London and she's working for a firm called Control Risks, who are, from what I understand, they're mercenaries. It's a mercenary firm and they're big in Iraq. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. Uh, but, but also I, yeah. also her relationship with... Um, or, the, the, I mean, to Mark Wasserman, uh, she, they, they were married... Um, I don't know when they got married, but they were certainly married in the, 1990, the late 1990s. And the firm, uh, uh, Sidley Austin, act for HSBC in other matters, not just the monitoring. They act; they actually act for the bank. So there's a major conflict there. So they will just say, well, Chinese walls. Um, but interestingly, they advised in tax matters for HFC Bank, which was Household Finance Corporation in the States, when uh, HSBC purchased them in 2003. Uh, Did you work for them as well? No, I've never worked. Did I've never work? worked for HSBC or HFC. I work for solicitors, acting for HFC. Right, okay. um, but the, that's what but, I meant. The, so, so you had something. But to the do interesting that. thing about that is, um, so there, there is already a connection with with that law firm and HSBC. Um, but it was it's been widely reported. Well, it, a few years ago, it was widely reported that many people believed that it was that purchase by HSBC of HFC. That was the beginning of the the, the financial crisis because it uh, legitimised subprime borrowing. With HSBC, uh, HFC were the largest subprime lenders in America, and with HSBC purchasing them, it gave it some kind of respectability which it previously lacked because HFC were such a criminal bank. Um, but it was okay. It was a HSBC's profit warning in. February 2007, which was the start of the financial crisis, and it was all to do with subprime mortgages. Right, okay. Well, I'd love to blame him for that too, but um, obviously <laughs> I won't stretch that far. Um, so, 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 the, so the reason for our call again is that you have been alerted to the existence of documents that show that Lisa Osowski, who's in charge of the Serious Fraud Office, who is supposed to be uh, scrutinizing the affairs of all financial and other uh, large companies in this country and small, um, preventing serious fraud. Um, she's a client, she's borrowed money from HSBC who have got into massive trouble with so many people in so many places yeah. and she's supposed to be, what's the word, uh, objective and neutral, but in actual fact her links with them are 
enormous, yeah. uh, inclu- including the fact that um, they are her bank manager. Yeah. I, I also, I've, I've uh, just remembered I've left out a major important aspect to this. Last year, remember at the beginning I was talking about Amber Rudd and the National Crime Agency. Last year, the National Crime Agency were told to drop their investigation into the uh, Russian money laundering. Because who did that, Amber Rudd? Well, well, uh, the official records say it was the Foreign Office, um, but she's the Home Office. Uh, you know who who knows, but she is certainly in charge of the National Crime Agency. Um, and the, the point is that all any investigation into Russian money laundering would lead to HSBC, and they were told to drop. Well, when you say when you say it's the Foreign Office, I mean that's Boris, isn't it? At that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, Boris. I don't know. I mean, they'll say it. And Boris, he's he played tennis for six hundred grand. Yeah. Or grand <laughs> well, or they'll they'll say anything. He played tennis he, with the. I, you know, they, they might have said Foreign Office to deflect from the fact that it was Amber Rudd. I don't know, but you know that's not the point. The point is they were told to drop the investigation. So you know nothing is will point to HSBC. It, it, that's that's what is going on, and every you know the the, the the people at the top of this government are protecting HSBC. Well, it's also no secret that the Conservative Party have taken a lot of money from Russian. Yes, uh, yes, and and last week the um, the new chair of the Committee for Standards in Public Life which is responsible for overseeing MPs' expenses, um, cash for questions and that kind of thing. The new chair is Lord Evans, who is an HSBC director. I mean, they have basically taken over the government. Yeah. I mean, I remember Richard Murphy of the Tax Justice Network. I remember listening to a tax cast that he did about five or six years ago. Mm. Um was very good but uh, i remember at one point you know he spoke just as a matter of fact about the takeover of hmrc by uh, pwc and uh, kpmg you know he just he you know he referred to it as the takeover and it sounds very much as though um a very similar thing has happened in other elements of our public life by hsbc yeah i mean uh, i i i challenge people to to find any public body that hasn't got a connection with hsbc i can't find one even Transparency mm. International, you know, who who rate Britain as one of the least corrupt countries in the world, they bank with HSBC. I mean, they are everywhere. I mean, the the recent scandal with Patisserie Valerie, they bank with HSBC, and that there was this secret overdraft. Um, I mean, the, last year in July last year, Carillion. May, uh, issued a profit warning. Carillion had now gone bust. But in July last year, the government, the, the UK finance, uh, 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 export finance, it's called, which is now overseen by Rona Fairhead, they guaranteed... A, is it? Yes, now it is. It wasn't in July last year. But they guaranteed a $600 million loan from HSBC to Carillion for a job in Dubai. Carillion and, right. and, and incidentally, uh, Carillion and Keir, the construction company Keir. Now, uh, Amber Rudd's brother, who is a PR, he owns a PR company called Finsbury. They represent both HSBC and Keir Construction. And that's where you bring in the uh, Hinkley Point nuclear yes, power yes, station. Yes, right? uh, They got the um, Keir got the, the construction job for Hinkley Point, and it's it's Chinese money. Uh, brokered by HSBC. Yeah, because I understand that HSBC were representing EDF, China, um, yeah. and uh, Kia. Yeah. And yeah. Um, interesting how the PR and the marketing people um, have a fair old say into what happens in terms of these deals. Yeah. I mean, uh, in that film, um, Gangsters of Finance, a French film, uh, they actually say that basically Britain gave up its sovereignty for, for HSBC in, in that Hinkley deal. And that's, I mean, on, on, on the first, the first image on my, on the, the home page of my website, is an article from the Associated Press that talks about the lawmakers and Brexit, um, but they illustrate the article with a picture of HSBC towers, implying that the lawmakers in Britain is HSBC, which is which is what my point is, which is what my campaign is basically about. Well, I mean, I remember when when the. When, when Theresa May came in, 
people were wondering whether or not her assistant Nick Timothy uh, was going to help her stand up to whether it is HSBC or whoever to prevent the Hinkley deal. And I know they did it for a bit, but then afterwards they went through with it. Um, and lots of specialists said this is the worst deal ever. Full stop. Well, Amber Rupp was uh, Amber Rupp was the energy secretary at the time. Right, and so it was the worst deal ever. It was the worst deal yeah. ever. It was the worst deal ever, and yet it was being waved through. Yeah. Um, but it the the that documentary showed that for China to become the global reserve currency, it needs to be taken seriously, not by buying a few buildings, but by getting involved in Western public infrastructure projects. Absolutely, you know? and the big and the um, biggest foreign bank in China is HSBC. Yeah, I mean, I strongly recommend people to watch that film. It's by Mark Roach, who has become a Brexiteer, funnily enough. Uh, Belgian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's Belgian. Um, I came across him nearly 20 years ago when I lived in France, and I was investigating water companies. Okay. And he did some really good work on that, and he's done a film about Goldman Sachs. He lives well. in London, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think he's in he's in Notting Hill next door to Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, okay, um, do we have anything else to say on this subject? Because um, that's enough patience from our listeners so far. I don't think so. We could talk about the Davos in the desert and HSBC, but that's probably for another day. Or or okay, the or well, the, um, the, the or the Bill Browder Magnitsky farce. Um, that's another HSBC cover up story. Uh, but but okay, again, that's um, probably for another podcast. Hello again. Um, yeah, that was Nicholas Wilson talking to me a couple of weeks ago about the information that he discovered that Lisa Rostovsky, who is in charge of the serious fraud office, has taken out a mortgage yeah, with HSBC at a time when she was supposed to be overseeing them for their deferred prosecution agreement with um, Exeger uh, and the Department of Justice. Right, so I've just been to get the papers. And I can see that on page 14 of The Sun, there's this story here. How press campaigner secretly taped PM talks. A press campaign group member secretly recorded discussions between former Prime Minister David Cameron and media intrusion victims the High Court heard yesterday. A covert tape of the sensitive conversations was made by a colleague of Dr Evan Harris, an ex-Lib Dem MP, and senior member of Hacked Off Court Documents Say. And then listen to how they do this. The subterfuge was employed despite the meeting being formally declared as completely confidential. About 30 victims of press misconduct, including Kate McCann, were present. They were told that what is said in this room must stay in this room during the Westminster meeting on November 21st, 2012. Lord Justice Davis, sitting with Mr Justice Oosley, said the meeting should not have been recorded. The tape will invite a charge of hypocrisy against Hacked Off, which purports to be opposed to the dark arts, said to have been employed by tabloid newspapers. The recording came to light at a court hearing in which victims of alleged mispress conduct are challenging the government's decision not to hold the second part of the Leveson inquiry into press ethics. Look at the wording on that. Alleged press misconduct. That is to say that the Daily Mail are saying that they're pushing this angle that there was no press misconduct at all. Amazing. And as I said last week, Kate Maltby said, feminists for press freedom but completely ignoring everything to do with uh, the surveillance angle and the actual harassment and the press intrusion. Okay, so here we go to an interview that I did with John Ford, He, who is the blagger. He raided bins, hacked phones, got into telef uh, banking, uh, raided people's bank accounts, didn't nick any money, but just got information about where they'd been, hotels, that sort of thing. Um, here's an interview with him 
from last week? Honour amongst blaggers is very simple. Um, as a blagger, um, there was a community of us um, um, and we shared a, a, a common um, philosophy, which was um, information was our, uh, our uh, product. Um, and so um, uh, we, we were... Uh, we didn't consider ourselves thieves uh, because we were um, stealing information. We would have uh, access to, uh, uh, I mean, I would obtain passwords and I could easily um, uh, have made um, multi, multi-million pound transfers on the spot from high net worth individuals' accounts that I was in the middle of. For You know, it was regular that I was... Uh, speaking to Coots um, as someone who might have two and a half, three million in their current account. Um, and the the honour was, um, one, never to lie, um, always to um, deliver the information to your client um, as it was, um, and never to embellish that. Um, and the second thing was to never to steal. Um, it was... Um, in the main, uh, particularly when I was working for the Sunday Times, the um, overriding ethic was that I was working in the public interest and as such, ver- veracity was everything. Um, so um, I would base my uh, reports on truth uh, of what had been recovered using artistry and uh, and deception, um, uh, but the product was always 100% truthful. For a top bank like Coots, um, one is uh, given an account manager and the way into a Coots account is to ring Coots in the Strand um, and say that uh, your name is Mr. Whatever um, and that you received a letter that the your account manager had uh, been um, shifted and there was a new chap handling your account whose name you didn't have they would ask you your name and then they would say, ah, yes, your uh, your account manager is Mr. Burns. So then you say, ah, that's the chap, right, I'll write to him now. You put the phone down and then you ring up another branch of Coots who will pick up the phone and they'll say, good afternoon, um, and you say, yes, this is Mr. Arbuthnot. Um, could I speak to Mr. Burns, please, my uh, account officer? Um and uh, you'd be transferred not to Mr. Burns, but to a pool of people who are operating um, on his behalf. Um, and it was really as simple as that. They, uh, um, in fact, in many ways, the higher status the target, the easier it was to get the information. So um, once you got into Coots, um they might ask you a few questions, but if you're banking at Coots, you're probably in who's who, so your mother's maiden name, all those sorts of details are just, you know, just a three-page flick in who's who, and, and they're provided for you. Uh, the rest of it is often guesswork. Usually a memorable date will be the day that you got married, or you can plead amnesia. Um the art of blagging is about establishing reciprocity. So um, the um, uh, it's about being charming. It's about um, uh, establishing a rapport with the person with whom you are talking. So um, you're very nice to them. You use humor and you use um, a relaxed tone um, and, yeah, charm. Uh, Internally, you'll be feeling extreme uh, anxiety and the run-up to making a call might take three days of, of, of 
physical agony because of the anxiety. I used to use Valium um, and other um, uh, ways. I mean, lots of self-hypnosis, lots and lots of walking and lots and lots. I used to ring my mother, for example, uh, uh, and say, you know, how, how Indian does this sound? Or how, you know, am I passable as a Geordie mum? And she'd say, go on, off you go. Or... And I practiced the accent. So um, until in the end, um, the the character would emerge and uh, you'd look at your phone, you'd take a deep breath and off you went. Uh, you know, good afternoon, it's Mr. Khan speaking. I want to know, you know, waiting for payment. Can tell me if it's come, you know, or, or, or whatever accent was apposite. One of the interesting things about the use of accents as well, uh, uh, particularly when it came to um, foreign accents and also foreign agencies and banks and so forth, um, was um, playing into the racist assumptions that people had about, say, uh, Asians, Africans, uh, and so forth. So... Uh, I would ring a Swiss bank, um, and the more absurdly African I sounded, the more uh, I created the image of a, of, a, of a warrior chief with a bone through his nose. Um, the, the more the more credible I was to this Swiss person when I asked if uh, you know I'm waiting for a payment for two million dollars coming from Bank of America, uh, you know, and and so forth, um, and the Swiss in their polite but uh, very uh, covertly racist way would, um, would, would oblige by not asking too many questions and, uh, and providing the goods. That was John Ford from a few days ago talking about his experiences as a blagger. There's more to come from that interview. I will make sure that I uh, put that up. Just going through the papers again, I can see that in The Guardian there's absolutely no trace of the judicial review into Leveson. So even though, the Guard even though it's The Guardian that... Um, it was their research into phone hacking that led to the Leveson inquiry. They don't seem to be taking any ownership over the part two. And that is sad. As I said, the Daily Mail have said what they've said about... Um, they've tried to make it look as though hacked off have been dishonest by taping a confidential meeting. But the fact is, a promise was made, or at least it looks like that, doesn't it? Um... A press campaign member secretly recorded discussions. The subterfuge was employed. Yeah, so what's happening is that the... They're saying that he taped the discussions, but they're not saying what was said in the discussions. And I suppose they could get away with that by saying it was supposed to be taped. But... So they have a recording of the Prime Minister making a promise, which he then broke. And on the same day, the Prime Minister is talking about coming back to politics. Sorry, not the Prime Minister, David Cameron. So the man who broke his promise is talking about coming back. This is surreal. I will... Shall I sign off? Yeah, I think I'm going to sign off now. Thank you very much for listening. I will start getting ready to go up to part two of the Judicial Review. And I'll let you know more about that when I can. Thank you.